All right. So um, let's get uh, started. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, pr uh, elaborate on many of the issues that you heard this morning. Um, so uh, we'll try to uh, do it as slowly uh, as possible, but still things may get a little uh, hurried at times. So you can I mean, uh, stop me at any time, seek any clarification that you want. And uh, well, uh, there is no fixed amount to be covered. So uh, we can just take it as it comes. So all right. So what is it that I want to talk about? Um, uh, the issues were what you um, uh, saw in the morning. Um, let me um, make it. Um, just uh, sort of take you back a little bit as what the background is, that what one is uh, talking about is this very complicated uh, flow, um, and uh, complicated in what sense? That uh, you are looking at the basic, uh, let me write it big enough, I mean, if you don't, so Del Navier-Stokes equation, which you saw written down, uh, several times in the morning. So this is uh, equal to minus gradient of V plus theta del square V plus what would be F external. We can uh, talk about it. Um, uh, we will uh, talk about F external uh, as we go along. So, but that's the general structure. You have the total derivative of the velocity. Um, uh, so uh, that's Newton's law. Here is the DDT, um, uh, the partial derivative here, and then the advective term, the gradient of pressure driving the um, um, uh, flow, and the dissipative action coming from the uh, viscosity, and then any external force that you may uh, have. And if it's an incompressible flow, so incompressible flow would have the additional constraint that it is divergence of V equal to zero. Otherwise, there is going to be a continuity uh, equation, which is del rho del T plus divergence of rho V uh, equals, if I ignore the diffusion term as Professor Verma did in the morning, uh, then I would get a, a zero. Uh, on the right hand side. Uh, <clears throat> that's the mass conservation law over here for you. That's the momentum conservation um, uh, in the absence of this uh, dissipative term. And conservation laws have a way of expressing themselves, uh, which, uh, I mean, here is mass conservation for you. This is also the form of uh, charge conservation, where when rho is the density, charge density, and that's the uh, current density. And conservation laws generally look like that there is a del del t of something which equals the minus divergence of something or other. So this has the same feature. So as an um, uh, uh, assignment, if I ignore these chaps over here, uh, you should uh, try and uh, make sure that you can write this equation as del T V, um, uh, uh, that is the structure would have to be uh, for the ith component, that is minus the divergence. This time it would be some tensor uh, Tij, uh, where Tij would be quadratic in the uh, velocities and there would be an appropriate pressure term. So as an exercise, you can try casting this equation uh, in this form, keeping the incompressibility uh, in mind. And if, uh, that's the easiest. If it is uh, compressible, then also it should be possible to cast it in um, uh, uh, this form, except that you would have a row over here. You would have to keep the row inside. It's the momentum uh, density which is being uh, conserved and or written in the form of a conservation law 
in the absence of external forces, and the rho would have to be here, and uh, you can uh, work out uh, the rest. So uh, this is the form for the incompressible uh, case, and more, slightly more complicated if it were. So anyway, so that's that, but the important thing is that conservation laws would have a form like this, which is something which we will emphasize repeatedly because conservation laws will play a very important role in what we uh, want to do. So, uh, this, so this is our, going to be our starting point um, uh, for now, that I have an incompressible fluid. It is um, uh, governed by this equation over here. And I'm interested, so what are you interested in, given this equation over here? Your interest would be that if at t equal to zero, v is equal to some initial function v0 of r. So at given this, that given this fact over here, you want to know what is v as a function of r at a time t. So v of r and t is what you want to know. Given this over here, you find this by solving this equation. All right, so that's the issue. That's what the basic problem in uh, fluid dynamics would be. Except now, where is the trouble? Trouble is that when this nonlinear term begins to dominate, begins, becomes very big, then you have the uh, rather uncomfortable situation that I can give you a function. So nonlinearity, nonlinearity strong, and you can have this sort of uncomfortable situation that at t equal to zero, I give you v of zero r plus, let's say, some small, in whatever sense, small change uh, in the velocity pattern, the initial velocity pattern, um, and, uh, that is the initial condition, which now has to be a function, uh, is uh, slightly different from the uh, one which I had given you over here. You expect that the answer, uh, expect that this v at time t would simply be some, whatever you had found before for this, plus some small change. So that would be the nice thing to happen, but this is what at the strong nonlinearity does not happen, and that is where the problem is. That there is this, the initial conditions, things can be very sensitive to initial conditions. This is something which uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, low dimensional uh, systems and maps, low dimensional uh, systems and maps, uh, these are uh, very well understood. Uh, that there is this very sensitive, uh, when the nonlinearity becomes strong, there is a very sensitive dependence on initial condition. Now, this sensitive dependence on initial condition can be disastrous because of the following reason. That all these, I mean, in any practical situation, uh, the point would be that when you give this input, um, then uh, it would be some kind of a measured input. I mean, you measure the velocity field at time uh, t equal to zero, you put that in as your initial data, and you want to know what the velocity field would be at some later time. Now, the point is that your initial data, measurement of that might have a small error. Now, what, you, what the actual field is, let's say, is some v uh, um, uh, zero r, that's the real thing, and you have some, uh, but you, your measurement, there is a certain amount of error, and what you are putting in is something which is this. Now, 
you are putting this in and churning out numbers and at later time you are going to get out of this some v of r and t so this time develops so this is u working and it gives some v of r and t but the system uh, doesn't know that that's what you have put in it works according to v0 of r and it uh, uh, time develops according to this equation in its own way and when this reaches some v prime of r and t these two may be very different from each other and then your prediction has gone wrong so this is where life in practice can become very problematic and therefore the point with at these very high nonlinearities the general loose statement that uh, the solutions of Navier-Stokes equation are, are, are sort of unpredictable uh, is this question unpredictable means that it is very sensitive to initial conditions and therefore I mean that sort of takes on the form of unpredictability and therefore what you want to do it is not very um, uh, convenient to talk about a uh, solution uh, uh, to ask the question whether um, I will get this answer, a uh, correct answer V of R and T, you ask the question about uh, that what is the probability uh, of finding, the probability uh, P of finding this answer uh, V of R at uh, R and T, which is at time T. So you want to talk about a probabilistic description rather than a deterministic description. So you talk about uh, probability of finding a particular um, uh, velocity, R and T, as a solution of a given initial condition um, uh, and uh, a set of initial conditions um, uh, which you put in, which are reasonably close to each other. Uh, you generate different uh, solutions at time T and what you want to talk about is the probability distribution associated with the uh, velocity field. So the sh position shifts. Your answer now, I mean, what you are looking for is the probability distribution rather than uh, the actual V of R and T. At very high nonlinearities, talking about this actual V of R and T may be troublesome and therefore talking about these probabilities are better. But which probability, whose probability, uh, that is the um, a big question. So whose probability uh, do I uh, look at? So that's question number one. I mean, do I straightway look at the probabilities associated with um, uh, this velocity as a function of r and uh, t, or do I look at something else? Second, uh, of course, that uh, which uh, obviously has to come first uh, in some ways, that when is this nonlinearity strong? So that's the very easy part to answer. So you answer first, when is nonlinearity very strong? And for that, you just need to estimate, uh, this is the acceleration part, the left-hand side. The forces are all over here. This gradient of P is actually slaved to this for the divergence-free fluid because that doesn't have an independent existence. You take a divergence of this equation and the first term, del t divergence v, divergence v is zero. The second term is non-zero. It is divergence of v dot grad acting on v. So divergence of this, this is equal to the next term, 
is minus del square p, and then again zero. Uh, the external forces, whenever they are there, uh, uh, for right uh, for now, we'll just take them to be solenoidal, and therefore no uh, divergence coming from them. And so del square p is related to this term over here. So I can actually um, uh, the p is not uh, independent variable. It is uh, no different. I mean, uh, it, it is uh, uh, an, uh, not uh, different in any way uh, from this um, uh, an, an, uh, the gradient of p is um, uh, related to this p. Uh, grad p has the same sort of dimensions as this term over here, which is v dot grad v. So v dot grad v, this is uh, what? So you, if you want to look at grad p, you take a grad over here, you take a grad over here, and then uh, the grad p, this del square comes on this side and the del squares cancel out, and the p is actually dimensionally the same as v dot grad v. So that's not, uh, there is no complication uh, which can for arguments which depend on uh, dimensions and so on. Um, uh, this is not a player. So uh, it's slave to the velocity field. So the player is this one over here. And so the nonlinear term is going to be uh, dominated, uh, is going to be represented by this. That's the, and the um, uh, linear chap, the linear chap is this one. Uh, we don't, um, uh, the external uh, forces don't enter the picture. So that's del square v. So you make, if it's a characteristic length scale is your L, then you estimate this as v square over L, and this as nu v over L square. Uh, that's, let's say, some characteristic velocity, which let's denote by uh, capital V, and therefore uh, this is LV, dimensionless number, LV over nu, known as the Reynolds number. So it's Reynolds number which determines whether the nonlinearity is strong or weak. So Reynolds number generally denoted as RE, RE much, much greater than one. That's the condition under which the nonlinear terms dominate. So this flow with a Reynolds number much greater than one is likely to uh, become uh, sensitive uh, to initial um, uh, conditions. And uh, that is when, instead of talking about the solution itself, you want to talk about uh, um, uh, the probability distribution associated with the uh, uh, solution, and this is where the second that uh, once I have this, whose probability distribution should I be looking at? That is, if I want to have a nice systematic study, what would be the quantity uh, which I would uh, look at? And this is where the answers came from Kolmogorov. Uh, in, in 1941. What Kolmogorov said was that look at this quantity delta V, which is V, this is delta V of R, which is V of X plus R minus So v of x plus r um, uh, minus um, uh, v of x averaged over. So this is, uh, 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 you take various x's, add them. I mean, so uh, let's say uh, if I put it like this, you take a set of x vectors, and then uh, with the same r vector, you uh, calculate this difference over here, and finally divide out by the number of i's, that number of x i's that you have taken. So you want to look at this delta v of um, uh, r vector 
So, and you take in a, a various points in the liquid, look at what's happening at, um, uh, for each point, look at what's happening at a vector r uh, distance away, look at this difference in the um, uh, velocity um, uh, field, and, and so uh, you average over the uh, number of x initial uh, points that you have taken, and that defines this delta v of r, and Kolmogorov's point was that this p probability distribution of delta v of r is universal in some range, so which is, uh, we are going to qualify uh, this um, uh, range over here. So the point that Kolmogorov made was that, look, I mean, uh, why would you, I mean, if, if you, if I were to study uh, so for every fluid, if I were to study a probability distribution, and every time I have a fluid, if I have to do the study once again, um, or then life would be complicated. Whereas, I mean, if his point was that if I look at this object, the probability distribution of this object, then uh, this is independent of um, uh, what um, uh, the uh, uh, magnitude of the velocity is um, uh, in, um, that is, uh, these uh, various uh, velocities at various points, uh, what are the um, uh, distribution of the velocities at different points and so on. This delta v, uh, probability distribution of delta v of r is independent of uh, the nature of fluid the actual precise nature of the velocity field and so on. So this is what he focused on, and this was supposed to be um, a nice thing to um, uh, calculate. Further, the claim was that in this range over here, the, if you look at the moments, then delta v dotted with the unit vector along the this radius r raised to the power n and the expectation value of that, that is the moment calculated with this, uh, uh, is equal to something which we are going to to the power r, r to the power n by 3. So this was a statement about the moments of this distribution. Number one, there is a distribution. Number two, there, the moments of the distribution will have a R dependence, which is n by three, if R is small. And once again, so one has to talk about what is small. So if R is small, so this difference over here, this di the difference be between uh, the two points, this R vector, that is the, that magnitude is supposed to be small in some sense. And uh, the, so which range, what is small, and so on, are the issues that these, these are um, uh, just the uh, statements that um, are um, uh, being made right now. For n equal to 3, Kolmogorov could actually calculate starting from Navier-Stokes equation and show that delta v dot r raised to the power 3 average is minus 4 by 5 times something which I haven't yet, times r, which corresponds to n equal to 3. So this was an exact answer. Um, this I'll put in a uh, uh, little later. So the ex this is an exact answer which gives credence to the fact that uh, this is um, uh, pr uh, probably right. So these were the things which um, uh, Kolmogorov um, uh, said, and in, uh, there was the other which is supposed to be very famous, which is what uh, everybody knows Kolmogorov about, in this turbulence business, the five-thirds law. So 
there is this Kolmogorov five-thirds law, and he made a statement, this five-thirds law, let me um, uh, explain um, uh, what uh, that is, that has to do uh, with the energy per unit mass. So the total kinetic energy, so the only energy that this fluid has is kinetic energy, and uh, the kinetic energy per unit mass, if I call it E, is going to be E equal to, so kinetic energy half mv square at a particular uh, position, that is the, um, uh, so this is rho d3r, take a dm, a small uh, element of the fluid, its mass is rho uh, d um, uh, times d3r, so you integrate that and divide out by the total mass m, the, if rho is, if it's an incompressible fluid, m is rho times v, so this is equal to 1 over 2v, uh, v square r, d 3 r, which is uh, the sort of average value of v square. So v square, different values at different r's, averaged over the whole value, a whole space is uh, sort of, uh, is uh, expectation value, v square r. And this E is, if uh, there is a, a energy spectrum associated with it, you write E define, this is the definition, that E is written as EK dk, where k is the momentum or wave vector uh, wave vector space. So k is the wave vector space and k is the magnitude over here. The Fourier space, which uh, Professor Verma was talking about in the morning. So that's the Fourier space. Uh, k um, uh, and, uh, is the uh, wave number space or wave vector space, uh, wave, uh, the um, uh, Fourier space. And this integral e k d k that defines the this is the definition of the energy spec so called energy spectrum. And Kolmogorov's assertion was the e, e k is equal to something in some change, which uh, once again is what one has to. So this is, the, these are the statements. These are the um, findings with uh, which uh, Kolmogorov had and which uh, we are going to be uh, in the business of trying to get at. So there was this assertion that instead of the uh, probability distribution with the velocity field is associated with the difference in velocity between two neighboring points, why neighboring, that has to be an um, uh, issue. And uh, so uh, then this is supposed to be universal in some range. So there's a question of what is this range? And the moments in, those, in that particular range are given by this. And uh, for small r, which is where, I mean, all this is universal, you have an exact result for n equal to 3, and that's that. And so then there is the energy spectrum and the associated scaling behavior, which goes as k to the power minus five thirds, which is called the Kolmogorov five thirds law. And that, uh, uh, this is the summary essentially of what uh, uh, turbulence is about. Uh, high Reynolds number flow, the high Reynolds number flow appears random. So in that, in the sense that it is very sensitive to initial conditions, therefore uh, it is a solution, you can, uh, can loosely say that this is a solution of uh, the Navier-Stokes equation in the high Reynolds number limit, which gives V as a sort of random function of uh, space and time. Random functions require probability distributions, so we want to talk about probability distributions, but then 
when one is you want to talk about something where a minimum of labor uh, is involved and minimum labor would be things which are universal and universal is when one talks about this delta v rather than v itself which is the velocity difference between uh, two neighboring points and then you have certain results uh, result about the uh, 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 this, uh, moment, moment of the um, uh, and, uh, distribution, moments of the distribution, an exact result which corresponds to the third moment, and some, uh, the energy obviously with a square over here corresponds to n equal to two, and uh, so the energy which is uh, n equal to two part of that uh, thing uh, is related, uh, you, gives rise to an energy spectrum, and the energy spectrum as this form So uh, Mahindra Varma actually wrote down, when they wrote, wrote down the uh, energy spectrum for you, the Kolmogorov spectrum, this is what it is. And as he said, a dimensional analysis will uh, get you that. So that's a summary. And from uh, and now it will be our purpose to try and understand what essentially leads to, I mean, we, that, Obviously, uh, there, there is nothing which can be exactly uh, said except that exact derivation, which involves a lot of work. I won't go into that. But the logic has to be sort of inexorable. That is, there has to be some very clear logic of why these statements are made. And that is what I will try to um, get at, starting with Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, try to, for the next half an hour, uh, convince you that while no actual hardcore maths is done, there is between simplified maths and logic uh, inevitability about this whole thing. So that is what uh, we are after. Uh, is that, I mean, up to this point is are things clear? There is, a, yeah. Space as well as time. So get, let's get started. So we'll get started from here. Uh, so uh, I get, I start with del T V plus V dot gradient of V is minus gradient of p plus nu del square v plus some external force f, which uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, all right, uh, let, uh, some external force f. Uh, not not uh, one of these body forces, which uh, Mahindra talked about in the later half of his um, uh, lecture. Uh, not the body forces, uh, some external force, which is going to be more like the uh, stirring force. That is, you take, or, all right, I mean, let's uh, get this point across also, that uh, the, um, uh, in, uh, if you are uh, drinking tea or coffee and you add sugar to it, inevitably you stir it up, right? I mean, the stirring it up mixes it. So the transport, with which, I mean, when we actually started in the morning, the transport becoming um, big or small. Now, this is transport once again. Uh, the turbulent transport is much more efficient. So that's why you stir up the uh, uh, sugar in the tea or coffee. It mixes very fast. If you let diffusion do the job for you, it will do it. But as he showed for the perfume, it will take a long time. But it, it, it will mix anyway. But the point is, if you stir things up and cause the fluid to become um, uh, turbulent, that's the turbulent mixing uh, does, is far more efficient. The transport properties are enhanced. And uh, that's a very um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, common example of uh, turbulence going to work for you. So this F over here is not a body force. It is the kind of force that you use to stir your tea or coffee. So uh, it is uh, a force which you are applying, uh, as he very carefully said, around the 
a boundary at sort of large scales that uh, you can see. So keep that in mind, that we are not talking about right now uh, body forces like gravity or uh, mm, uh, rotation, Coriolis forces. All right, so what? Energy is where one is headed. So energy is the um, uh, thing to look for. So you want to look at B squared by 2 integral B3R energy per unit mass, and you want to look at Delhi del T. So Delhi del T is going to be integral V uh, J V J dot B3R. So this is uh, uh, two V, and so it is V dot uh, V dotted with V dot. So uh, Vj, uh, v, so repeated index summed over. So this is really the dot product, which I'm writing um, uh, in this fashion, which is equal to Vj, and then it is minus gradient of, um, so it is minus del Jp minus, uh, I'm substituting for Vj dot, the other term uh, is minus Vl, del L on Vj uh, plus nu uh, del square Vj plus f of j. So that's it. So that's what um, uh, you have. Delhi del T is equal to this. Delhi del T equal to that. Now what's the first term? Uh, this is all integrated over D3R. If you don't, if you find me having an integral sign and dropping the D3R, uh, it's an error. Don't worry, put it in. Um, uh, so, um, uh, the, so I, I'm going to go term by term. And remember that divergence V is zero, so del J Vj equals zero. Hmm? All right? So, First term, integral Vj del Jp d3r is integral del Jp Vj d3r. Right or wrong? From here to here? Right? Agreed that it's right or not? There are two terms coming out of this derivative. One is going to be the Vj times del Jp. That's this term over here. What's the other term? Other term is P del J Vj, but that's zero. So therefore, this is right. So this is a divergence of this vector over a volume. So that by this divergence Gauss's theorem has to be the surface integral over the bounding volume, over the bounding surface. Right? So this is over the whole volume in which your fluid is located. So it's something like this. So this is S, the bounding surface, and that's your V. And uh, now, if it is, the surface is sufficiently far away, the velocities will fall off, and uh, the surface integral would go to zero. If the, even if the surfaces are close by, the boundary condition says, which Mahendra mentioned in the morning, that V has to be zero on the surface. So on the surface, the velocity is zero. So therefore, I mean, uh, this quantity has to vanish on the surface, and therefore the surface integral of this has always is always zero. Therefore, this is equal to zero. Happy with that? Free-slip boundary conditions, obviously, this is not true, but free-slip boundary conditions never happen, so why worry? I mean, uh, we start, I, I, either it falls off, I mean, if it is not bounded, and if there is a boundary, it is going to be, I mean, uh, the vis any viscous fluid. And if it is not uh, uh, viscous fluid, then, uh, I mean, uh, many bets are off. Uh, 
Um, next term, integral Vj, Vl, del L, Vj. Two steps here. First, write this as integral Vl, ah, del L, V square by 2. I have taken, I mean, this is Vj del L Vj, which I'm writing as del L V square over 2. And then the next step is integral del L V square over 2 Vl, because what I have added in is 0. Huh? Correct? So, now, back to the same logic, I've reduced it to a divergence. Divergence is going to be the, um, uh, 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 this quantity evaluated on the surface and integrated over, once again, zero, and um, either way too far away falls off or um, the viscous boundary condition, and so that's zero. So, gone. This is gone, this is gone. Not bad, no? I mean, uh, bad, the nonlinear term's gone, mind you. Not doing very badly at all. So, new del Vj, new del square Vj, integral D3R. So, you do by parts. Huh? So you do by uh, do this by parts, and then this is minus the first part where you write vj and uh, one derivative, one integral of del square vj, which would be some uh, a, a single derivative instead of a double derivative, and this v once again making it vanish at the boundaries. Then with a minus sign. And it's a derivative of this, and it's an integral of this, which is the derivative of V. So it is going to be del I Vj squared D3R. Right? So del E del T is equal to minus new integral del V i del X j with sum over, I mean summed over all the i j's and so on, D3 R plus integral F j V j. So that is going to be the big result. So this is this is it, right? I mean, all of, at at this point, are you with me up to this point? Yeah, all of you, right up to here. Now. This is negative definite, which is as it should be. Viscosity dissipates energy. Better be negative here. This is the external forcing which pumps energy into the system. If there is no possibility of pumping energy into the system, eventually the motion will stop. As t tends to infinity, v would have to go to zero. That is what which would be called decaying turbulence, which I won't talk about. I'll talk about a steady state where, I mean, things appear stationary uh, in time. So if I don't have this term over here, things decay. And as I said, the technical term is de uh, decaying turbulence for that. Uh, we'll talk about something where, uh, so all right. This is negative definite, and that causes the energy to decay. This, I'll assume that it pumps, that is, the F that I have given pumps energy 
n and I'll call this integral epsilon. So what is epsilon? It is the rate. So del E del T is equal to minus new integral grad V square D3 R plus epsilon. This is the rate at which energy pumped in. And this is the rate of dissipation. So pumping in at rate epsilon and the and if I want a steady state, E not changing, so the total energy not changing with time, that's the definition. It's not an equilibrium state, not a, but the total energy is unchanged. It's a steady state so far as the, so it's a non-equilibrium uh, steady state. The condition is that epsilon all right so steady state the total energy in the system constant in time and uh, that implies that epsilon the rate at which you are pumping energy into the system is equal to this. Now, that is a very strange answer because where do I want things to work? Turbulence is, as I said, when the nonlinear terms dominate, they dominate for Reynolds number much greater than one. The ultimate, I mean, thing would be that Reynolds number becoming very big, infinitely big, which can happen with new going to, uh, this uh, viscosity going to zero. So if viscosity is made smaller and smaller headed to, then the Reynolds number can become bigger and bigger. But, you see, for this steady state, even if I, this is fixed by what you are doing, and if the fluid changes to make the new smaller and smaller, this has to become bigger and bigger in order that the integral can compensate, integral can become big so that it compensates for new tending to zero. All right? Now, what is, what determines gradient of V? It is what you are talking about is V x plus delta R minus V of x divided by delta R, right? I mean, that is what well, the derivative is all about. And if the V is a regular function of R, the, uh, the, the, then the derivative is just a constant, re regular function then uh, of position. The derivative you expect some number. Ah, um, I, I, I should have, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, one uh, uh, velocity, uh, one volume term which I uh, should have had in the definition of E uh, that's uh, missing. Uh, I should uh, have uh, written that. There is a 1 over V everywhere. Sorry about that. So you and, uh, and, uh, expect um, uh, some number, 
and if it is some number which you are not cons then the integral over an d3 r would give you a volume which would cancel this volume over here and epsilon and as nu goes to zero this thing would vanish consequently for it not to vanish as delta r becomes very small this vx plus delta r this this is the delta v that i have been uh, talking about so the delta v has made its appearance and delta v has to be proportional for this small r to some power delta r which is less than 1 because if it is less than 1 that is when this an 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 uh, epsilon um, uh, uh, the your um, uh, there would be a singularity um, uh, at the origin and that singularity um, uh, would uh, sort of uh, uh, would kill the um, uh, uh, would make this that singularity would make the integral blow up and then new tending to zero times this would uh, do. So you ex so the action. This is why Kolmogorov focused on the delta v that for this small separations. That's where the whole action of this steady state turbulence is that it is the non-analyticity of this term over here at short distances which is the characteristic property which uh, you would like to capture uh, i mean there may be several other things which you might uh, like to these things mind you uh, are always sort of uh, motivated by uh, um, uh, somebody who is talking about it or somebody who had done, who has done it uh, there can be several other things which can be of interest but uh, this along this particular line of thinking uh, what i'm trying to establish that it is the small distance behavior uh, of this delta v which is striking and therefore uh, uh, it is something which is uh, worth talking about now the fact that delta v and this is a turbulent which is a random kind of thing and the fact that it is not going as delta v is not going as delta r uh, but as some smaller power should not is not so surprising if you consider your uh, ordinary something like random walk uh, diffusion process uh, random walks and so on where this i mean in a small step delta t delta x square goes as uh, delta t so in these diffusive processes or in this uh, random box um, uh, your it is delta x square as delta t delta x square normally i mean would you expect to go delta x to go as delta t but in these random processes the thing is that delta t delta x goes as delta t to the power half which is less than one what is happening in this picture over here that the delta v which is the distance uh, uh, velocity difference between two neighboring points is not proportional to delta r but is proportional to delta r to the power one minus or something smaller um, uh, than one and that is i mean there is some analogy with this over here uh, that in another in random processes which we are familiar with I mean, this kind of fractional powers are not um, unknown. And uh, so uh, this is another uh, question of fractional powers uh, coming um, uh, over here. So it is, so therefore the first point that if I want to describe this uh, question of turbulence, then it is interesting to talk about uh, this um, uh, velocity difference delta v so this first issue that we um, uh, did uh, uh, talk about that is that why focus on uh, this chap uh, over here well 
you focus on that because this steady state condition uh, gives you a, um, a condition which sort of tells you that this v, delta V over here has some unusual property uh, with respect to delta R. And so that's interesting. And that's why uh, the focus was on uh, the focus was on that. So all right, that's step one. But now, all right, it also says that this is a derivative. So delta R is small. And so immediately the question is, how, what is meant by, so the next thing that we want to tackle is what is small. So uh, uh, we have uh, come to the point where uh, in this delta V with a small separation is emphasized. And uh, now we want to, that small separation, what is meant by the small separation? What, what, what is it? Uh, uh, what is this small about? And how, I mean, all right, okay. So, but it, so far, um, uh, comfortable. And uh, the point also is that, uh, I mean, that uh, maybe, I mean, uh, small, large, all these scales can uh, sort of merge and uh, life can uh, become uh, very problematic. So, uh, let's see what these things are. Uh, I have uh, this epsilon has become a player in the game because it is the rate, constant rate at which you are supplying energy to the system. So, uh, Epsilon is going to make an appearance when you talk, uh, talk about scales. Talk about scales. Epsilon is always going to be there. Uh, if I'm going to talk about a small scale, then small scale is where dissipations uh, all right this um, uh, dissipation therefore i mean as you can see that things are happening i mean this has to sort of become very the uh, new is small the integral has to become big the derivative has to become big derivative big means some anomalous behavior of this uh, velocity difference over here so um, uh, at small scales the new the viscosity is a player. So epsilon is a player and nu is a player and I want to construct just by dimension and uh, dimensional analysis a scale which is L0. What is a, a epsilon? The rate of pumping in energy per unit mass. Energy per unit mass has the dimension so these are all questions of dimension. L square over T square, one over T, right? So that's the dimension, which is L square over T cubed. What is the dimension of the kinematic viscosity? It is a diffusion coefficient, diffusion of momentum. So it is L square divided by t. If I want to form a length out of these two chaps, I have to take a ratio so that the t goes out, which means I should raise a, a new uh, to the power 3. So if I want to uh, find L0, I take new, raise it to the power 3 and uh, divide it by uh, epsilon, and then it is L0 uh, to the power 4, right? So L0 equals nu 
to the power three quarter over epsilon uh, to the power one quarter. Now comes, so this is a small scale. What's the large scale? So there is a large scale, let me call it some L0. At the large scale that we have, uh, it's um, this L0, th th at the large scale I'm putting energy in, and so the players that I have over here are this large scale L0, there is a velocity sort of velocity V0, which I have set in uh, motion at the macroscopic scale. So there is L0, V0, and there is the same epsilon, which is the energy which you are uh, pumping in. So out of this, uh, an, 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 uh, the velocity and this epsilon over here, we are going to generate this large scale over here, the V0 is L divided by T. The epsilon, as we have uh, an, uh, seen, is L squared over T cubed. So if I want to form L0, I'll take a, a, a V0 cubed. I'll take a, a V0 cubed and uh, divide it out by epsilon. So I take a V0 cubed and uh, divided out by an uh, epsilon, so that's L cubed over T cubed, and divided that, that's L0. So I have a large scale, which is L0, which is V0 cubed over epsilon. I have a small scale, which is small L0, which is this. So take the ratio L0 over L0 is equal to V0 cubed over epsilon nu, uh, no, epsilon to the power one quarter divided by uh, nu to the power three quarters. So that's epsilon to the power three quarters over here. So it is V0 cubed over epsilon to the power three quarters nu to the power three quarters, which is equal to V0 cubed divided by, uh, back to your um, uh, epsilon, uh, which is uh, this. So I'm going to um, uh, use this over here, which is V0, uh, and uh, it is three quarters, so it is nine by four, so it is V0 and then L0 uh, to the power three quarters, and uh, there is nu to the power three quarter. V0 cubed over V0, nine by four is also three quarters. So this is VL0 divided by nu to the power three quarters, which is the Reynolds number raised to the power. So that sets up the next stage. That the dissipation takes place at a scale small l zero, and the input energy input is at a scale which is capital L zero. And the, if I look at the ratio of these two, the ratio of these two is proportional to Reynolds number to the power three quarter. So if Reynolds number becomes very big, these scales are far separate. So at large Reynolds number, so Re much, much greater than one, this can be, I mean, so if I'm talking about uh, Reynolds number of like 10 to the power um, eight, let's say, then this is a separation of 10 to the power six. So the picture that when they had in the morning, the scales uh, here, the uh, let's say the uh, large uh, scales, and here the small scales, 
these scales are indeed well separated when the Reynolds number is large, and this is L0 over here, this is L0 over here, and it is these which know about the system. Small L0 determined by the viscosity and so on depends on the system itself. Capital L0 depends on how you are feeding energy into the system and so on. So things which you are doing, the fluids that you are, the fluid that you are choosing determine the scales which are L0 and L, small L0 over here. In between, if you are far away from those scales over here, is something which is impervious to what's happening near the boundaries or what's happening when uh, the viscous dissipation is taking place. And this region, which is sort of safely away from boundaries at two ends, is what is called the inertial range. So inertial range is right in the middle over here. And the Kolmogorov statement about what is big and what is small, the universal in some range, this some range, the statement over here, is the, the so-called inertial range over here, which is far away from the um, properties uh, of the system and therefore has universal behavior. So this is at large Reynolds number where the flow is turbulent. You have indeed a, a range where things should be uh, looking independent of the kind of system. So this is what is so attractive about um, uh, these things. And so the uh, point where we are is that uh, we have identified the so-called inertial range. And uh, the inertial range is where the Kolmogorov action is going to lie. Now, before we uh, take the next step, it is important to um, it is important to establish. Uh, it, it sort of uh, all, all this seems like uh, uh, some kind of so something funny. In the sense that here I started out talking about nonlinear terms. Nonlinearity causes problems. That is why, I mean, the whole thing is nonlinearity driven. And the nonlinear terms, these two chaps over here, have sort of gone out of the picture. I mean, we are focusing, all our discussion has been on this equation over here which has been obtained after uh, discarding the uh, nonlinear terms. So what are the non so what is the role of, uh, of the nonlinear term? What is so before taking the next step, I want to clarify the role of the uh, nonlinear terms, which uh, in the morning Professor Verma was uh, sort of pointed out, and I just want to take a few minutes uh, to actually uh, do that a uh, uh, little carefully. Um, uh, because that's something uh, which uh, one uh, should be knowing. All right, so uh, and, uh, otherwise this looks like some kind of black magic. So VI RT plus BJ del J VI uh, equal to minus I B plus U. That's I want to write it in Fourier space. So at this point, uh, uh, right, because these uh, up to the at the up to this point, it was 
comfortable uh, talking about things in coordinate space and, uh, and uh, showing you things. Uh, the next one, I mean, where I want to talk about the uh, importance of these, uh, uh, I, I think it is imperative uh, to talk about, um, uh, to go into uh, uh, the Fourier space. So Fourier transforms, which uh, you have already uh, seen uh, in the morning, BIR is B3K 2Pi cubed. I k e to the power i k dot r. So that's the Fourier transform with the back transform uh, b i k equals integral b three r and uh, uh, it sometimes pays to put in the v uh, volume explicitly and uh, will not. it, but, but I mean, uh, the, uh, normalizing it by uh, uh, having a 1 over v is the, uh, no, uh, is, uh, the usual norm. So uh, vik and uh, vir and uh, d3r and e to the power uh, minus ikr. So that's how the uh, transform comes. And uh, this is, uh, so going back and forth uh, through these uh, relations between the transform. All right, so uh, here is where we uh, get started. Here is VIR. So it is D3K 2 pi cubed VI dot K e to the power I K dot R D3R, uh, D3K. Uh, no, no, no. Right. Now this term. Um, I, I will not. Uh, I, I will do this term carefully. I mean, this, as I said, is slave to it and sort of follows uh, 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 from it. So I'm not going to waste any time on that one. But this one, let me do it um, uh, carefully. So v j for v j, let me write d three p two pi cubed v j p e to the power i dot r del j of v i v i all right let me del j and v i let me write d 3 q divided by 2 pi cubed e v uh, what is this i j j i uh, q e to the power i q dot r. So that's an, uh, this, this term over here. So that is the term that I want to um, explore. Uh, this is the first term, and this is the other. And, um, uh, and uh, this is going to be, I, I want to take this. Uh, Chap e three p over two pi cubed e to the power r i p dot r. This is del j. The derivative acts over here, so it is i q j. So uh, uh, what's going to uh, uh, come down is i q j. Uh, and then it is integral uh, d uh, well, put an integral over here so that uh, things d three q over two pi cubed, and then it is e uh, v i q e to the power i q dot r. So it is i q j e to the power i p dot r. Where is my v j p? Missed it. V j p. So v j p i q j v i q e to the power i q. Good.
Right. Now, what? I want to pick up this term. I want to pick up this term over here. That is, what is it that I am after? I am after V I K E plus, and that plus is what I am after. All right. So what would I do? I mean, uh, if and uh, if I wanted to, I mean, uh, uh, let me uh, or let let's uh, uh, put a, uh, just because I happen to use a k over there uh, was not. Uh, uh, very bright uh, idea, uh, but let me uh, make, uh, I mean, just put a K0 over here so that I don't, uh, 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 I don't make sort of uh, ass of myself here. So uh, if I want to pick out that VI dot K0, what do I do? I multiply by, I multiply this by E to the power minus I K0 dot R and integrate over d3r. So I multiply by e to the power minus ik0 dot r and integrate over d3r, which will tell me, integrating over d3r tells me that this plus this is a delta function in k minus k0. It exists only if k minus k0. And then integrating over this would make it vi dot k0. So to get this k0 uh, out, you do, I mean, you take this inverse e to the power minus k0 dot r, integrate over d3r and get. So I have to do this same, I mean, if I do e to the power minus i k0 dot r d3 integral, I have to do this, the same thing over here. So you multiply by k0, i k0 r, and I'm going to do the integral over d3r. So what? there is going to be a delta function. What would be, um, uh, uh, where am I? Uh, over here. So there would be a delta function. The delta function would be uh, this P plus Q minus K0. So P delta function would be in P plus Q minus K0. And then you do the integral over Q. And Q, that would mean once you have done the integral over Q, Q has to be replaced by K minus P. The delta function is in P plus Q minus K0. And when you are integrated over Q, then the answer has to be that replace Q by K0 minus P. So the next term that uh, you are from over here, what am I going to pick up? that integral over p remains, that has not been touched, d3p, and uh, these chaps are gone because that produced this delta function over here. So I still have vjp, that, nothing has happened to that. It is iqj has become a0j minus pj, and uh, so that, that is done, and this is gone, and Viq is now Viq0 minus P. Right? So this is um, uh, what has happened. So this is what this um, uh, uh, term has uh, uh, reduced to. Now there is divergence V equal to zero, divergence V equal to zero means that in Fourier space, Pj, Vjp is equal to zero. So that's the uh, statement of this in Fourier space. Divergence is del J, Vj equal to zero. For Vj, put in the uh, Fourier transform uh, that you have over here. So if I were to take this and write a del I, then I would be bringing down uh, I K I over here. So it is K I V I, which would be equal to zero. So divergence of this equal to zero is K I V I um, uh, equal to zero. So P J V J P is equal to zero if it's P. And now notice then that uh, uh, this, uh, where I have uh, reduced it to this, 
it is i k zero j minus p j, but v j p p j has to be equal to zero by the divergence precondition, and consequently, this term over here, because of the divergence precondition, is uh, v zero dot k plus v dot k zero rather integral d three p over pi cubed and it is i k zero j and then it is v j p and it is v uh, i k zero. So that's the second term. I mean, one, I mean, the, you, uh, this may have been a bit fast, but the steps should be clear so that you can go home and work it out. And if not, I mean, uh, so th this is the third term, which is this one, as I said, has to be just I identical in structure. That is, there has to be this and this, but what will differ? It is the coupling over here, i k zero j, which would be something else because that has all these uh, del squares and uh, so on and so forth in it. The pressure, as uh, you uh, remember, del square p is equal to, uh, it is del i del j, uh, it is V J del J V I. So V J del J V I. So that's this uh, part over here, which I have. But del square is a K square. So there would be a one over K square coming over here. And this del I and del J would be K I K J. And so uh, what is what is just I K zero over here would become more complicated having factors like uh, k0 i k0 j divided by k0 square and uh, so nothing else other than I mean these niceties over here plus contribution from there and the viscous term is simply minus new k square k0 square v of k0 because the just the gradient is i k so del square is minus k square and whatever is. So k0, uh, I'll now, I, I can go ahead and call uh, uh, an, uh, k0 as k. So it is v dot k plus nu k, so v i, v i k equals m i j k. So let's not uh, mix these i j l, which depends on k, and then it is v j p, and it is v l k minus p integral d three p e i q plus. So that is the structure, that is the structure of Navier-Stokes equation in momentum space. So that's the structure, it is new vi dot plus new k square vi is this nonlinear term over here, m i j l k v j p v l k minus p d three p two pi cube f of t. So that's that's the structure. M i j l is a combination of uh, 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 this k uh, uh, over here and uh, some projection operators which involve uh, k, uh, k i k j delta i j and k i k j over uh, k square. And uh, uh, so if you go home and work it out carefully, uh, 
if I take a sine uh, m i j l as a function of k should be i. This is the i which is square root of minus 1. I think it's going to be i over 2 k j p i l k plus k l p i j k where p i j k is delta i j minus k i k j over square. So that's that's what it should be when um, uh, give or take a sign there could be overall minus sign which I uh, might have uh, but and, and, and that that's what it is when the uh, dust settles. The ki part, as you can see, the ki is what we got over here. That's what we have already got. And the I motivated the other part by saying that this del square p equals this. The del square brings in the one over k square, which is this, and the uh, del i del j brings in the ki. So uh, all right. So this is Navier-Stokes, and now. If I didn't have this nonlinear term, uh, if I did vi, um, uh, uh, if that nonlinear term contribution was not to be there, uh, then uh, just the mode k, uh, that would decay according to this uh, with the time scale of nu k square, which is the way it should be, viscosity causes things to decay. All right, so now what we were looking at, just take five minutes here to stop. We were looking at, uh, the kinetic energy, that's what, so now I want to look at the kinetic energy at the scale, I mean it is E is this sort of EK, if I write uh, uh, EK And, and then, uh, because, well, what is this? Um, let me make it. Uh, this is certainly V square D3R with a uh, 1 over 2 V. That is what this is. There is Parsival's theorem, so which will tell you that this is half uh, integral V K V minus K uh, D3K. That's the result of uh, Parsival's theorem. So uh, this is what I'm calling uh, C of k. So it is vk, v minus k, and I want to look at e dot. So this is what I'm focusing on, this part over here, vk, v minus k, and because it is, uh, uh, we are talking about probability distribution, it's best to talk about uh, av uh, averages over the probability distribution. So ensemble averages uh, E dot is DDT of V I K V I minus K uh, with a half over here. So the average, I mean, instead of, I mean, you average over the uh, ensemble um, uh, which you have uh, and uh, it is half DDT of this which is half uh, v i dot k v i minus k plus a similar term over here. Now, what is this v i dot k? This is, I mean, this one I know, I mean, when uh, you put in over here, it is v i k v i minus k and that's this decay. It is this term which I'm interested in. So this term, that part over there, is forget the half right now. I mean, those are imp unimportant. I, J, L, K, and then I have V, I, minus K, V, J, P, and it is V, L, K, minus P, D3P over here. So here is this term over here. 
So this is this triad of minus k. So there are three v's at wave numbers minus k, p, and k minus p. So this is the add up, the momentum of this total momentum adds up to zero, k1, k2, k3, and uh, adding up uh, uh, to zero over here. So you have this triad of wave numbers, and what is happening over here is that the, you, this, there is going to be a transfer of energy from one, let's say, from this P over here to this coupling, what this coupling is telling you that P gets coupled to minus K and K minus P. So energy gets transferred from P to minus K and K minus P. So there is this triad of wave vectors which transfer energy among themselves and so you form these triads and have energy transfer. And the, what the nonlinear terms do for you is transfers energy from the large scales to the small scale. The nonlinear terms went away when the total budget was concerned. But the total budget simply told you that there was a input and there was some decay. In between, the energy had to travel this path from large scales to small scales in real space. And what brought the transfer along was this nonlinear term over here. So the beauty of the nonlinear term lies in the fact, the importance of it, that that is what transfers energy from one scale, P, to other scales which connect to it through minus k and k minus p. So this triad of interaction, so E dot, so energy is at the scale k. So energy at the scale k is changing because of this coupling, because k can transfer to p and uh, uh, k minus p. So that transfer uh, over here from uh, one k to a couple of others which are related by this k1, k2 plus k3 equal to zero. That's the um, uh, uh, transfer mechanism to this triad. That transfer takes you from uh, 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 one, uh, the large scales to the small scales. And the nonlinear terms having accomplished that, uh, you have the uh, scenario that there is a universal range in between where, I mean, the uh, energy input and energy uh, dissipated doesn't um, uh, seem to matter. And what Kolmogorov assumes is that this transfer that is taking place from one scale to another through this coupling over here, that is scale independent. That's the big statement that what you have over here, that this is, this is what the cascade is all about, that energy getting transferred from L, the large scales here, to the small scales here, in momentum space from large K0 here, um, uh, from small K0 here, sorry, uh, to large K0 here, so whichever way you want to look at it, large length scales to small length scales, small momentum scales to large momentum scales, the transfer is being done in a tight manner that this transfer over here is actually independent of the of wave number. There is a, this transfer is not scale dependent. That is, whatever is coming in at this scale over here is being transferred to the next scale, transferred to the next scale, next scale, next scale. So that's what the cascade is all about. It cascades down and, and a tight cascade, no fluctuation, so no scale dependence, and off you go from here. So that's the total picture that there is an input at uh, large length scales, 
there is dissipation at um, um, uh, uh, small length scales, and in between the nonlinear terms, transfer energy from one scale to another without a scale at a constant rate, which is equal to the rate at which energy is being pumped in and at which it is being dissipated. So there is very tight transfer across this scale independent transfer. But there are Vs which also have K dependence, and the whole thing has to conspire to make it scale independent. So uh, that's the, uh, yeah, absolutely. So they conspire in such a manner uh, which actually, I mean, if I were to, um, uh, all right, that in the uh, next half, uh, that uh, if one is going to do, uh, genuine uh, calculation of these things, then uh, the imposing what one has to impose, that this uh, three-point function multiplied this MIJL, that has to uh, be uh, scaling. 